We are parents, teachers, and educators. And like you, we're passionate about restoring our culture for Christ. This is Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Hello again, I'm Marlon Detweiler, and you've come to listen to Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Today, we have one of our online teachers in our online school, Veritas Scholars Academy, Travis Southern. Travis, welcome. Uh, Marlon, it is an honor to join you. I've enjoyed the podcast uh, since it began. Well, I'm glad to hear somebody's listening to them. Thank you. Now you get to be somebody speaking to them. Tell <laughs> us about yourself personally, your your personal circumstances, family, that sort of thing. Sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm uh, so I'm married to the uh, beautiful uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Southern. So Mandy Southern, and she's also a teacher here at uh, Veritas. She teaches in the grammar program. And uh, teaches grammar, writing, and also geography in uh, at Veritas. Uh, we've been married for 23 years. Just celebrated 23. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. We have three children. Our oldest is uh, is a nurse. She is uh, a nurse at the local hospital. Is about to graduate with her RN. And, oh wow. uh, Then my uh, middle son. He's about to go off to college at the uh, university University of Oklahoma in uh in the fall and then my youngest is a student at veritas so he is a uh all, well he's finishing up his eighth grade year right now good that's wonderful yeah the, the school year uh uh is closing down now right. how did you come to Veri come to teach at veritas tell us the story of how you got here yeah, it actually is. Uh, it, it coincided with our our children finding uh, with us both finding Veritas, both for as an educator and then also as a dad. So I have both of those hats going on at the same time. Uh, so I, I find the school uh, not only a place to work at, but a place that I trust with my my own children. Uh, so it actually happened when we were when my children were young. And so we began homeschooling really when my oldest was a kindergartner. And uh, we didn't know anything about homeschooling. We didn't know any homeschoolers. Our family thought we were weird as anything <laughs> because I, I grew up in the you know public school and so did my wife. And so, you know, they were like, what are you doing? You're messing them up. Things like that. You know, that's some people here. Uh, but uh, but we looked at different curriculum. We tried a few curricula for a few years and they they worked. And then we we actually first uh, came into contact with uh, classical education through a uh, through CC. So many people probably know what uh, CC is, Class of Conversations. And uh, as we got into that organization, we noticed they had this set of cards uh, that were, at the time, uh, they were Veritas press cards uh, yeah. that they would memorize and go through. And we started looking at those and studying those like, this is really good. <laughs> Who are these people? And then after that, we looked them with looked you guys up on the internet, and we started taking your online classes to supplement. And then we're like, "This is phenomenal!" Uh, the uh, self-paced classes. And uh, then uh, <laughs> over time, I saw that Veritas had an ad for a chemistry teacher, and I applied for it and got a call. I think from you or Bob. I can't remember who called me first, but uh, it was several years ago. And uh, and it all worked out from there, and we are we have been really blessed. In the time frame, in the years that you've taught for us, you've taught a couple different things. Most of it's been in science, I believe. But tell us what you've taught. Right? Yeah, I've taught quite a few science classes, but also rhetoric. So, uh, so I teach uh, earth science. I teach uh, physical science and biology, chemistry. I have taught organic chemistry before. And also rhetoric. And this summer I'm teaching an omnibus class. Are <laughs> oh, you really? Good for you. Yeah, That'll yeah. be fun. Which one are you teaching? Uh, I'm teaching uh, Omni. Actually, I'm teaching two, Omni 5 and 6, so secondary. Okay. So, yeah. But I love to read, so this is like my yeah. wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really great. Um, now, during college, you had a really special opportunity. Most people listening, at least those that have been involved in homeschooling, will know the name John Saxon or Saxon Math. John, of course, the founder of Saxon. Tell us how, what you did in college with Saxon. Right, yeah. Yeah, when I was in college, I remember I was a uh, sophomore and they put an ad in the local, in the college newspaper looking for somebody to come and, and uh, proofread their textbooks and uh, draw figures for math problems. And I said, well, I think I could probably do that. And I applied and uh, got rejected at first. <laughs> I interviewed and 
they rejected me and then they called me back. I guess they couldn't find anybody better. And then they, uh, <laughs> so I got hired by uh, John Saxon and Saxon Publishers. And I got to work there for several years, all the way through college. And then eventually right. became a team lead, team lead in yeah. their pre-press department and, uh, and loved it. Worked on there primarily with, oh, I worked with John Saxon, Stephen Hake, and also uh, Frank Wong. And I uh, knew them all well. well yeah, it was uh, three three of the main people in the history of the company when it first started. Tell us about John Saxon. I had the opportunity to speak to him once before he passed many years ago, at least two decades. And I was fascinated by him, but you knew him better than I did, better than almost anybody that might be listening. Tell us about him. What was he like? Yeah. Oh, he was he was very intense. He was a mission driven uh, I think he was really the evangelist for the company. <laughs> and so if uh, if you could get him started talking about mathematics education in the United States, uh, he would give you an earful. In fact, if you there's a really good YouTube video out there uh, that you can find. it's a it's a sixty minutes uh, article or sixty minutes uh, segment that features John Saxon. It is very informative on his history and his ideas and so, how he did a, uh, a a rotational model of uh, or an incremental model really of uh, teaching mathematics. Yeah. So he was an old engineer that hated the way math was taught. And so this is not teaching anybody how to do this. He taught a co college class where he threw out the textbook, wrote his own textbook that became algebra one. And, uh, oh, and then it was just on from there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he was definitely um, a leader in his field and somebody who just uh, wasn't going to take the status quo for granted. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it got a lot of kickback at first. People didn't receive his methods, didn't receive his approach in the beginning. But as he began to prove it, he gave away textbooks at the beginning saying, just try it and yeah. see if it works. And it worked in some of the most difficult schools. And then it just <laughs> spread from there. Now you worked for the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration also. Was that right after college? It was. It was. In fact, uh, that's where I left uh, Saxon Publishers and went to work okay. for the FAA. Yeah, that's what yeah. you did there. Yeah, well, I've got my, I finished my degree in biochemistry and uh, business, actually. The FAA from... hired a biochemist? They did. They did, of all things. <laughs> it seems kind of odd. But I worked for an organization in Oklahoma City called uh, the Civil Aeromedical Institute, or like all government entities, they CAMI for short, uh, so Civil Aeromedical Institute. And their goal was to uh, basically investigate aircraft accidents. Okay. And so uh, my job, I worked in the toxicology lab, so something similar to like a CSI kind of thing. Oh, wow. Would, That's yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. It was pretty busy. We would do uh, both with the human factors lab, we would look at different medicines, different drugs, and see how it might affect pilots at high altitudes and uh, and what might need to be restricted. We also looked at, uh, in terms of fatal aviation accidents, was there any substances involved in those accidents that so you would, would look have for your judgment? pilots yeah. under the influence, that kind of thing? Right, exactly. And not just alcohol or illegal drugs, but any substance that yeah. might impair yeah. judgment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, people don't realize, I, as you know, I'm a pilot, and people don't realize how altitude affects you in and of itself with thinner oxygen, and uh, uh, nighttime can be a, a factor as well. And then you add to that something as simple as um, uh, a medicine or something like that. When I, 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 I was fascinated uh, I don't know what the legal, and it varies by state, but the, uh, what makes somebody uh, drunk behind the wheel of a car, but with flying, it's 0.02. Mm, mm -hmm. it's, two per, it's 0.02. And that is, I think, one-fifth uh, or so of what is typical of driving a car. And it, you know, it's like one beer or one glass of wine. It's very little and you don't, and you take it very seriously. You don't want to do that. And so right. that, oh, I'm absolutely. sure you ran into some interesting areas there. You are also a pastor. So you start going down this path and now you become a pastor. What was going, what happened? Yeah, I think the whole time I was growing up really, 
I felt a call to ministry. Okay. I knew that was the direction that uh, that the Lord would have me to head, but I resisted it as much as I possibly could. You know, Spurgeon, I think, once said, um, if you could do anything, I think it was Spurgeon, if you could do anything else, then go do that. Uh, but if you can't, then if that is your call in your in your life, it's unmistakable. I tried. <laughs> I tried to do the other things, and, and I kept coming back to the pulpit. I kept coming back to teaching the Word of God, kept coming back to preaching uh, God's truth, regardless of whether we lived in Oklahoma City or Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I remember one day I came home from work and said to my wife, I said, you know, I think the Lord is calling me into full-time ministry and calling our family into this. And uh, she said, well, I know I've just been waiting for you to say. <laughs> oh my, that's great. <laughs> so what the Lord a, what a welcoming her. answer. Oh, absolutely. Not everybody hears that. Sometimes it takes time, but yeah. she had already, she had already heard that. She already knew that and already seen that in, in me and the Lord blessed uh, so I left my job, went to seminary and uh, took the long road because we had, you know, kids had to pay my way through, work my way through. But uh, the Lord blessed. That and... was before you were teaching for us, too, wasn't it? That that's had... right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That was in 2005 when I left uh, the okay. secular workforce and then went to the uh, went to seminary. And then uh, I've been a pastor ever since. <laughs> that's great. So would you consider yourself now bivocational? Yeah, absolutely. Even even I would even call it uh, co-vocational because uh -huh. vocational is uh, more of like a pastor that would like to be full time. Uh, me, I really like doing both worlds. So I, I, I find myself as a pastor teacher. Uh, both of those roles kind of mesh together. Yeah, sure. I, I love what I do in both worlds. I couldn't imagine not preaching regularly. I'm part of a team, so it's not alone. We have a team of co-vocational pastors uh, that work together because nobody could do that by themselves. And uh, we're seeking to plant a church in uh, Eastern Washington, where there's not as not as much uh, gospel witness as there are in other parts of the country. Yeah, and you are in Eastern. Are you in Central Washington? We're in Eastern Washington, so right. in uh, Richland, uh, the uh, Tri Cities or Richland area. Okay, well, let's go back to um, what you teach. Most of what you've taught is science. You mentioned rhetoric. You mentioned uh, even teaching omnibus, uh, and uh, I'm thrilled to hear. Uh, with some of the things that you've taught, but with science in particular, which is what you've taught most for us, as I understand uh, the things that you've taught, uh, you've taught a broad number of science courses and many people kind of see science as outside uh, the whole realm of classical education. I think Latin logic, rhetoric, reading the great books, uh, those kinds of things, but science and sometimes math kind of get thought of as non-classical subjects. Let's dispel that rumor today. Why yeah. is science an important part of classical education? Ah, uh, good question. Good question. I think from, really from uh, you can just begin from an historical perspective that you really can't understand the history of the world without understanding the technological and scientific advancements and developments in, in society, really even going all the way back to Aristotle and his influence on the scientific world, the thinking on uh, things like spontaneous generation or his even theories of the universe, uh, cosmology, those kinds of things. And then even, even moving on from there, looking through the Middle Ages, uh, through the uh, through the Enlightenment and even through today, understanding a history of science is really understanding the history of the world. And so I think that uh, I think that classical education uh, actually lends itself very well to the study of science. It, it, I think it does, too. Let's unpack that a little bit more. Say a uh, family from your church came to you and said, my son's really interested in science. Why should they get a classical education? Why shouldn't they just study science? Oh, that's a really good question. I think one is you're taught how to read and be curious. Okay. My best students are the best readers and are those who are the most curious individuals. Wow. Yeah, that, I believe that. And when they learn how to read well, especially in the early, early grades, when they're learning how to read, pick apart sentences, understand sentence structure, understand how the language is communicated, 
you don't even understand how other languages are communicated in Latin. They they have this ability to uh, interpret, understand, and then grow in curiosity to ask the question, why? That's what I'm looking for. The students who come into my early classes and to earth science and to uh, physical science and general science who are asking the why questions. How does this work? Why does this happen? I think classical education ignites within them a curiosity because we're not hiding history from them. Yeah. We're not spoon feeding it to them. We're, we're giving them the, the nuts and bolts. Yes, we're giving them the grammar. But then when they get to the logic stage, they wonder how does this all fit together? That's where science can come in is to say, this is how the world fits together. This is how this works with this. Let me ask you a question. I assume you've thought some about this. And if you haven't, that's okay. You can say, well, I'm not exactly sure, but I think you will be. I've heard it said that students who are classically educated in the K-12 world who go into the sciences uh, in college and beyond, medicine and physics and and uh, 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 electro uh, uh, electrical sciences and that sort of thing, who are students who are classically educated may start slightly behind somebody that came out of a science driven magnet school that was focused on teaching science in the uh, high school years. So they may start behind them, but very quickly they will catch up and even surpass never to be caught up with again in terms of what they're able to learn what they and what they accomplish in their education. Why do you think that is? Oh, I totally agree. I've, I've seen that myself in my students that have gone on uh, from my classes. In fact, I was reading through some of the bios of students who are graduating this year at Veritas and I'm stunned about the number that are going into science. I'm like, yes. Uh, yeah, I've funny. watched that, it's fun, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it is. But I think that as a student who is classically trained and classically uh, in in a classical setting, is able to is is able to really diagnose problems better, and really able they, they, solving they, they, skills. Yeah, yeah, they know how to think, and so they yeah. know how to they know how to look at a tech. They know how to analyze a situation. They know how to look at a situation. They know how to learn. So rather than just learning how to take a test. They know how to teach themselves. They know how to learn. And they can approach a subject, even if it might be vague, and they know how to organize it in their minds, put it together in a faster way than their peers, <coughs> who might not be classically educated, can do. Yeah. Well, as we look at the sciences and we think in terms of biblical worldview, thinking and teaching and learning, obviously, one of the aspects of science that that distinguishes biblical worldview from a secular approach to science is a belief in a creator and creation. But let's let's take a look. What are some other aspects of science that make it distinctively Christian that you wouldn't find in secular education in the same way? Oh, yeah. You know, one of the things I teach in all my classes is at, at at all levels, whether it be in earth science or biology, at some point, we ought to be led to awe. And I think that's a distinctive characteristic of classical Christian science versus secular science, is awe that should lead us to worship. Awe meaning um, A-W-E, not Yeah, awe, that A-W-E. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, for example, like, uh, like uh, Psalm 19, says the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day after day, they pour forth speech. A few weeks ago, we were dissecting frogs in biology. And yes, we do that online and we do it live. We do it all together. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, moms, it's wild. It is wild. I love it. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and so at, in the middle of that, I had a student that said, this is so intricate. There is no way this happened by random mutation over long periods of time. This is the design of God. And at that moment, we just paused to just praise the Lord for his handiwork and the intricacies of chemistry. Another example, when they're in the middle of stoichiometry or they're in the middle of uh, electrochemistry, there's no way that could actually happen by random chance over time. This has all the hallmarks of design. And as classically educated, it ought to once again lift our hearts towards heaven and cause us to worship our creator. That, is, I think, is a unique hallmark of, of classical Christian education. It gives us that language 
of worship to bring to the table when it comes to our scientific enterprise. Yeah, that's uh, that's really a good word. Thank you. Mm. So you're going to be you have taught rhetoric. What drove what drove you to go from science to rhetoric? I I even, I don't know the answer to this, so it's not uh, a rhetorical question. Uh, I, I'm curious, what was it about rhetoric that wanted caused you to want to teach it? And do a good right, job. yeah, yeah. I think it's really living in both worlds as as both a science teacher and a pastor. I okay. see the importance of being able to communicate effectively, regardless of what it is that you study, whether you're, you know, whether you're an engineer or whether you're a teacher or or whether you're an accountant. You want to be able to communicate effectively. And so, uh, I got my doctorate. So I did my uh, did my PhD in uh, in applied theology and preaching. So okay. I studied a lot of rhetoric in that program and uh, just said, well, let's apply it. At first I thought, you know, I, th I, I think I wanna teach uh, teach seminary, teach higher level courses. But as I looked at my own heart and I looked at how can I really influence the world for Christ? I thought, I wanna go, I wanna teach the younger. Yeah. I wanna teach high school. I wanna teach people who are being formed in their understanding. Oh, that's and great, see that's great. God work in their lives and build in, the, build in their hearts a, a, a fire for, bringing the truth of God to this world that desperately needs it. Now, same question about teaching omnibus five and six secondary. Going from science to rhetoric, okay, you're a pastor, you're, you're thinking in terms of preaching and exposition of God's word and uh, the whole aspect of communication. Now, omnibus? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I just I'm just one of those people that loves to read and learn. And okay. so anything I get my hands on to read, my granddaddy taught me that when I was growing up. And so I, I just have this insatiable desire to keep learning and to keep growing. And so that's part of it. But I think part of it, too, is I want to demonstrate to students today that, you know, education to be educated in today's world oftentimes means it will mean more and more and more that it's a, you, you need to have a broad base of understanding that just highlighting and you'll have one major area that you'll focus in, but you're going to need a broad base of understanding to be able to function in society today that constantly is changing. That's, that's great. Yeah, I, uh, uh, do you get bored teaching the same thing uh, regularly? Is that part of it as well? Some of it, you know, there's, <laughs> I do like to have, I change things up sometimes, yeah. you yeah. know, quite a bit, but I like to have one thing that I'm changing up every year and, uh, you know, modifying the approach, how we're doing it. But, uh, but it's fun. I also love having the same students year after year. I, I find I have the same uh, names in my classes years after year, and I'd love to see them grow up and invest yeah. in them over that, the years. That, that we find when teachers change courses that they teach and students follow them and take those courses, we know why. It's because they're a great teacher. So thank <laughs> you for that. Um, all right, let's change the subject here for just a moment. What are you preaching on right now? Ah, what are we preaching? We're preaching through the Gospel of Luke uh, at our church. So uh, okay. we we practice expositional preaching. And so this coming Sunday is going to be in uh, Luke 19 with uh, Zacchaeus. So, so did you be... time Luke 2 for Christmas? You know, we didn't. We've been in Luke for a long time. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, well, longer Christmas. than Luke two is before Christmas. I was thinking right, Christmas a couple of years ago. After. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, Christmas two years, two Christmases ago, we were in, uh, in Luke two. So we've been there a long time. We've taken a few breaks here and there, uh, but uh, but we we've just been walking slowly through the Gospel of Luke and have really been blessed by it. Oh my! Tell us what we should take from what you're going to tell your congregation, and we could take from. Uh, Teaching on Zacchaeus. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think really for Zacchaeus, it really all goes back to the glory, the glory of Christ. You know, what I what we what we see there is uh Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That's the point of the story. Is Jesus came to the verse 10, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And as the lost are saved, there it says that the crowd brings glory to God. And I think there is, God is glorified in the salvation of sinners. And we ought to have a heart for people who are far from Christ to bring them, to bring them near. Even the outcasts of society, like Zacchaeus was, the tax collector. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, I, we have, uh, uh, you've taught for us now. I know you took a break as you started with this new call at the church a few years ago and came back 
You, you've taught for us for about 10 years. Is that right? I think actually, I think it's just five, uh, five at this point. So uh, yeah, yeah. So what about two, prior to that, wasn't there more prior to that? Uh, there was two before. So two before. Okay, so seven uh, years total. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I yeah. thought it was more than five. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Well, we are very blessed to have you, Travis. I thank you so much for joining us uh, on the podcast uh, today. Um, we have been really thrilled uh, with what we get from the students and their parents. Uh, and I, I know that uh, uh, what you're doing is making a difference. So thank you for doing that. Uh, you're very welcome. And it's my privilege and my joy. Thank you. Today, we have had Travis Southern, teacher at Veritas Scholars Academy in science and rhetoric, and now omnibus. Who knows what will be next? You're not going to teach French or anything, are you? Uh, probably not. Probably no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, folks, thank you for joining us on Veritas Box today, the voice of classical Christian education. Good night.